if everyone wildcrafted, if we were all stewards, if we were all visiting these places, protecting them, taking care of them, nurturing them, and spreading that love, I think we're going to be living in a much different world, a world that's you know more more based in love, more based in sustainability, and a lot more resilient. Hello, friends, and welcome to the Medicine Stories podcast, where we are remembering what it is to be human upon the earth. I am your host, Amber Magnolia Hill, and this is episode 65 with Rosalie de la Forêt. That's my attempt at French. I think it was okay. I apologize to a quarter of my ancestors who are French and to my maternal grandmother who spoke French as a child for not nailing the pronunciation. I think Rosalie will forgive me. Well, here we are again with another episode that was recorded not before coronavirus really hit and changed all of our lives, but at the beginning stages of that. And yet again, amazingly ties in what we talked about, ties into what is happening in the world because I don't know about you, but I am certainly taking a harder look at self-sufficiency and wild foods and what I know and what I don't know about really being able to support myself, my family, my community during times like these, knowing that this will happen again. Another viral pandemic will happen again. Other things will happen. Um, These are unstabilized times, unstabilizing times, and Hopefully, as we spoke about in the most recent episode with Ayanna Young, this is a big wake-up call. Um, if you haven't read Charles Eisenstein, my my guest on episode 60, his essay, The Coronation, I strongly recommend you do so. I'll put it in the show notes, of course. Um, there's so much potential right now, as you know, and that potential comes through on a societal level when we each as individuals step up, step forward, step into our power, empower ourselves and the people around us. And of course, food is just fundamental to that, something we all need, something we all need. And there's so much potential for humans to reweave our relationship with the wild, with the land, and with food and food systems. So keep that in mind as you listen to this interview today. And it's just, it's so amazingly perfect that Rosalie and her co-author Emily Hahn have put this book out at this time, this book all about wild remedies, sustainable wild crafting, foraging to nourish ourselves and others. I'm so excited to share this book with you. It really... I'm so deeply impressed with it. Um, It goes above and beyond what I thought it would when I first saw it and heard about it. And you can really get a sense for that in the interview. Um, Just really has got me thinking so much as spring comes on about my relationship with the land and with the plants and really um, mindful and conscious foraging. And I'm so excited to talk more about this. It's, you know, it's a hot topic in herbalism and there can be this call out culture around it. And there can be this fear of doing it wrong, right? Something that I'm really constantly looking at on this show, um, trying to gently persuade you all to not get caught up in how overwhelming it can seem to step onto the plant path and to the insane amounts of information out there. Um, But this is important. This is important. This is foundational and central to any practice of coming into relationship with the earth is these talks about wild remedies and respectful reciprocal relationships. So... Wow, there's a lot to talk about. I need to tell you about this book and the amazing bonuses that Rosalie and Emily have made available for people who order the book 
now at the beginning. This episode is being released the day the book comes out. They both happen to align on a Tuesday, so it was perfect. And, you know, in an effort to bump the sales and have a successful launch of the book, Rosalie and Emily have put together just some incredible bonuses for folks who buy it now. You know, hopefully you're going to buy it anyway and increase your knowledge on these topics. So might as well do it now and have access to number one. And of course, the uh, the link is in the show notes if you're like, how do I get there? Because you don't want to go straight to, you know, your the bookseller that you buy from online. You want to go to their landing page to make sure you get all the bonuses and then you can still buy through whoever you like to buy through. The first bonus is an incredible docu-series. It's numerous, numerous, beautifully shot um, videos, interviews with many different herbalists, um, including... Rosemary Gladstar, who I'm just mentioning because she is the she's been a past guest, and many other well-known people. Um, they ask many herbalists some important questions like, what are the unexpected ways that wild remedies heal? What does everyone need to know before harvesting wild plants? And will we be able to wildcraft forever? Um, it gets so deep. There's one with Seven Song, who's an amazing herbalist that I've been lucky enough to study with, where he shares 18 important tips for backcountry wildcrafting, hoping to be doing some of that this spring and summer. Um, there's an extra video called Wild Spring Feast, where Rosalie and Emily talk about dandelion, chickweed, violet, and nettle. There are separate videos, one each, just on plantain, mullein, and yarrow. And you can also learn about how herbalists, land stewards, and plant admirers can practice the art of wild tending. We talk a bit about that in this interview. Um, so those those are just incredible. I, I love these offerings. I love when people go above and beyond to really deliver value for people when they are trying to, um, you know, like promote their shit. I think it's awesome. They have this amazing book. It's beautifully done. And then they're giving you all this on top of it. If you buy it now and help them to boost their sales and, you know, get on that bestseller list. Um, there are also two giveaways happening. And these are happening like right now, this week, the first few days, I think even after this podcast comes out. So um, check those out. One is a wild remedies toolkit basket. And one is all sorts of herbal medicines from all sorts of amazing herbalists and brands that I would just love to have. And then there are some bonus downloads like a wild crafting checklist to look out before you go out. This is a thing you really want to be prepared and ready to go gather plant friends from the wild before you go. Don't just jump in your car in the morning all all full of excitement. You know, you need to be mindful and thoughtful about this. And then some blank labels that you can print out for the medicine that you're going to make. Um, So check those out. You know, if you're uncertain, just check out the website. So, so well done. And there's even more than what I just said too in the docu-series. There's like a lot more than I just listed. And then, of course, we have the the Patreon goodies for you. So these are all at patreon.com slash medicine stories. There are three things here. Two of them are for patrons at the $2 a month level, and one is open to everyone. So for patrons, there is a downloadable PDF of the entire chapter on Rose from the book which we all love Rose. (laughs) Episode 047 maybe of this podcast on Rose Medicine is still one that people are constantly getting in touch with me about and reposting on Instagram. Um, Just, I mean, it doesn't get any better than Rose Medicine. And so you can see the entire chapter there and see how well done these chapters are, how they're laid out, what kind of information is available for every other herb that's covered in the book as well. And then there's Rosalie's chickweed pesto recipe. Oh my gosh, we have been making a lot of chickweed pesto around here. You know, at the beginning of the the quarantine, when we had no idea, like, are the grocery stores going to stay open? What's going to be available? There's certainly some empty shelves at the store still. 
I just was like, oh, I'm going to make a ton of pesto. You know, it's spring. There are wild grains everywhere. And if I make a lot of pesto and freeze it, then at least we have these amazing phytonutrients available to us indefinitely if there are not vegetables and things that we can just go buy at the grocery store. We're also getting a lot more serious about our vegetable garden. We've been focused so much on herbs for so many years. Um, and I'm really interested in a root cellar situation. As an aside, <laughs> send me your root cellar porn. They're so amazing. Um, so on that note, I've recorded a special, very short, like three minute outro for this episode telling you my new favorite pesto freezing technique. I think it's genius. It's not the ice cube tray method. So you can listen to the end and hear that if you'd like to. And then the Patreon offering that's open to everyone is a giveaway of the book signed by Rosalie to you, the winner. So head over to patreon.com slash medicine stories to check that out. Um, I haven't decided on a closing date for that soon, but it'll be there and it'll just be in a few weeks probably. Um, If you have not yet taken my plant quiz, which healing herb is your spirit medicine, head over to mythicmedicine.love to do so. And one final note before we get into this interview, I say at the end in conversation with Rosalie, you know, don't get caught up in like knowing everything about every plant before you get out there to harvest it. And that echoes back to what I was saying a few minutes ago about just really wanting to encourage people to not get tripped up on everything they don't know. Um, But I feel like, you know, that was not the most responsible thing for me to say. And actually in this instance, when it comes to ethical wildcrafting, it actually is quite important to understand the plant you're working with, how it exists within its ecosystem, um, and how it reproduces before you get out there and start gathering it. So, you know, you can always just do a quick internet search before you go out if you know what you're looking for, how to harvest, how to sustainably harvest, um, how does it grow. And then, of course, in this book, they do give that kind of information. For example, from the rose chapter, they write, roses reproduce by seeds and rhizomes, leave enough flowers on the plant so it can form hips and seeds. Roses also send out new shoots or suckers from their rootstock, which can be dug up and transplanted. So in this book, they are giving those guidelines for the plants that they cover. Um, And it's just, you know, it's something that you'll learn over time. You'll learn it over time as you cultivate a relationship with each of the plants that become important to you and that you are getting to know out there in the wild. So yeah, there we go. I'm really, I'm so inspired. There's so many amazing recipes out of this book that I'm going to be making over the next few weeks as the springtime comes on. Just perfect timing. And I hope you all are doing well. I hope that in the midst of whatever hardship you're experiencing, I know it looks so different for all of us right now, that there is some inspiration being gleaned to increase your self-sufficiency and community sufficiency, really, and to um, tend your relationships with the medicinal plants growing all around you. Hi, Rosalie. Welcome to Medicine Stories. I'm so happy to finally be connecting with you. Oh, likewise, Amber. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I've been a fan of your work and just following you for a while. You know, I got tuned into learning herbs like over 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. When my oldest, who's now 13, was little. And um, so, you know, I think became aware of your work through them. And then, of course, got the book Alchemy of Herbs a few years ago when that came out. It's so beautiful, beautifully done. And so I'm really excited about your new book, Wild Remedies. And I was realizing that I don't really think I know your backstory. So I'm curious... Mm. What called you to the plant path? What was your journey? And I always like to ask people, do you see any connecting thread between your child self and Mm -hmm. what you are now doing in the world? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. um, I, well, I actually, one of my earliest memories of being kind of aware of plants in this way is that I uh, grew up in Southern Utah and my dad and I went on 
kind of a, it must've been some kind of guided hike. Um, we were in Snow Canyon National Park. I was maybe nine, 10 or something. And um, I don't have a lot of memories from my childhood. It's pretty, <laughs> my memory is not great in that regards. But I do, re- I do distinctly remember this. They were on this hike and the tour guide had pointed out what he called Mormon tea. And, um, you know, very common plant down there is used for uh, tea and um, closely related to ephedra. And so he said, like, you can break off a little bit and chew on it. And, you know, and, and people make tea out of this. And I just remember being floored, you know, like, (laughs) which is kind of sad, you know, just that that was such an alien concept that you could like interact with the plants around you. Mm -hmm. But it truly was an alien concept to me at that time. And I just remember being totally floored. Like I could not believe that you could do that. And I just thought that was so cool. Um, And I remember breaking it off and like, you know, if you just chew on, I still remember distinctly how it tastes and um, has an astringent taste to it. And I remember that, you know, just being that really distinct kind of bitter not entirely unpleasant, but for a palate of a nine or 10 year old, you know, it wasn't candy by any stretch <laughs> of the imagination. And, uh, but I remember even though it didn't taste like amazing to me, I just remember like I kept chewing on it for a long time and thinking that was so cool. And I remember like later, you know, I'd point it out to friends and just be like, isn't that cool? Um, but that was, you know, that's kind of it for that younger, the younger stage of life. And, um, throughout my teenager years, I was definitely really interested in health. And, um, like, um, I don't, I didn't know any of my friends that were interested in health the way I was, um, like going to the health food store was really fun for me. Um, ever since I was a little kid actually, and I especially love those like old school health food stores that have that like particular smell <laughs> mm-hmm. to them. I love that. Um, but yeah, I remember like when I got my driver's license, I was so excited because now I could drive myself to the health food store. <laughs> um, so I always had that and, um, and, uh, but it wasn't until, but it was always just kind of an interest of mine, you know, and it wasn't really a big, a big deal, a big thing, I guess. And, um, then it was after, um, college, I actually, I was, I studied, uh, anthropology and foreign languages in college and I had plans to like travel the world and teach English as a second language. And then I met this guy and he was really cool and he was really into like outdoor living and I didn't really know what that meant. And, um, but we just started like exploring that together. We went to a wilderness school and I just kind of got sucked into that world. It was just so amazing. And before I started going to wilderness school, I didn't know, um, any plants that grow around me. Basically my very first class was on how to make lip balms and salves. And the teacher kept talking about plantain and I had lived in the Dominican Republic, which uh, is in the Caribbean, where we ate lots of plantains, you know, the banana-like mm-hmm. fruit. And so I was like, really? Plantain grows here? <laughs> I just, you know, and I, I was so confused. And, and she's like, oh, yeah, everywhere. And, and she took me outside into her driveway and showed me plantain. Um, but that's like how much of a beginner I was, you know, that first day of class. Like I couldn't have been more newbie to the whole situation. So, um, but I really did just get get totally enveloped into that. And it was such an amazing experience for me to not know the plants around me, to not be connected to the world around me in that way. And then to have that world opened up to me and every day just felt so magical going out into the woods, going to a park, you know, or even just looking at what was growing in the cracks in the concrete in in Seattle where I lived was just so fascinating to me. And to learn not only, you know, the plants and their names, but to be developing these relationships with them, to knowing, you know, their many gifts um, and, you know, how they offer those as food, as medicine. We did everything in that uh, wilderness school, Um, the instructor, Karen Sherwood's an ethnobotanist. And and so it wasn't just an herbalist focus. It was really about everything from making debris shelters out of plants to, um, baskets to cordage to just everything you can possibly imagine. So, um, I just really got enveloped into that world. And, and then it was, um, after I'd been studying there for almost a year, I just came down with this really strange illness and, uh, it took, it was very severe. I was at home for a month I couldn't get out of bed. I had severe pain in my joints. I had this crazy fever. I'd get this fever at night and it'd be like 104. And then the daytime, it'd go down to 99. And I wouldn't have a fever during the daytime, but at n- every night, you know, I had this mm. fever like that. Um, 
so anyway, it was very weird. I thought I just had the flu. So I just, you know, stayed home and, but you know, I stayed home for a month and that was a really big deal. And, um, I ended up going to the hospital and they had a whole team of specialists and, you know, I'd been at wilderness school. So they were like testing me for like everything under the sun. Cause I'd been living rough outdoors a lot and stuff. So, um, but it finally, after a couple of weeks, they diagnosed me with a rare autoimmune disease and the, um, the doctors there, they were, they just said, good luck. Basically they said, we don't really know a lot about this autoimmune disease and it's very rare. And they literally gave me a brochure and they said, good luck. Um, they said that my life expectancy would be around 40 years old and I would have a declining quality of life up until that point. And, and that was all they had to offer to me. Um, which in some ways was a bit of a blessing, I think, because to have that door shut so firmly, uh, I just kind of did an about face and found other doors that were open to me. And mm-hmm. I started seeing acupuncturists, naturopaths, herbalists. I drank so many disgusting decoctions of Chinese herbs, mm. <laughs> which, which I'm so grateful for. I probably shouldn't say bad things about them because I do attribute them to helping me. But man, I would just stand over the sink and like take a swig of the Chinese herbs and then take a swig of like apples, apple juice or something to like chase it. Um, <laughs> It was so bad. Um, and But after six months of all of that care um, and doing so many different things, I was symptom-free. And it was at that point I was I knew that there were other people out there like me who had some kind of chronic illness who were told that there's just no solutions. And then – but there are solutions. And that was really a paradigm shift for me because I, I even though I'd always been interested in kind of alternative health, um, I thought it was just kind of like – you know, something that you did for minor things, but not, you know, kind of like Mm -hmm. instead of using over the counter drugs, you could, you know, use herbs or supplements, but I didn't up until that point, I really would never have like dreamed that something as severe as this rare terminal autoimmune disease could be addressed, um, you know, using herbs and, and everything else I did. So that was a real turning moment for me. And that was when I was just like, I'm going to, this is my life now. And, um, I went to school many different schools, um, spent about 10 years in school actually for herbs and, um, and yeah, did all, all sorts of things to uh, kind of on a path to being a clinical herbalist and, and to helping people. Yeah. As you said, that is so many people's stories of how they came to heal themselves and then become either an herbalist or just someone in like an alternative quote, health and wellness space. Um, Mm -hmm. and I just, I find it so bizarre that that modern medicine just it's such a limited paradigm and um even like that I've heard those exact words from so many people like there's nothing we can do good luck here's a brochure Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I actually I went back to my doctor um and this is like this kind of this makes me kind of giggle because I'm just like I'm in my early 20s at this stage you know um, I just, I know everything obviously, <laughs> but, but I had just gotten better, you know? Yeah. And so I went to her cause I thought she would probably want to know, like last time mm-hmm. she saw me, you know, that was, <laughs> I was given a death sentence and so, and now I'm better. So of course she wants to know. Right. And so I went back and I had this like presentation, <laughs> like, <laughs> basically, you know, just like all the different ways that I had like, you know, could think that contributed to my getting better. And, and I just, I think I had these just like kind of you know, very idealistic things. I just thought she would want to like run with that information. Yeah. <laughs> like, but, you know, her response was, um, I think she just kind of zeroed in on one of the things I mentioned, but she just said, there is no scientific evidence that diet can heal autoimmune disease. <laughs> and at that point, she was probably very correct. You know, like, the, you know, like there hadn't been a study looking at people with this particular autoimmune disease and like did, you know, had half the people do a regular diet, half the people do, you know, mm-hmm. like there, she was technically correct. Yeah. Um, but just the like non interest and like, um, but you know, from her perspective, I could just see like this, you know, young woman comes in just being like, I've cured this yeah. <laughs> rare disease, but yeah, she just had zero interest. And you know, back then this is like early two thousands and back then things you know, in terms of autoimmunity, like there was not a widespread understanding or appreciation within the medical world about intestinal permeability and leaky gut, Mm -hmm. like the way there is now, you know, like, I don't think that would be as like brushed aside as much now, you know, we do have more 
things linking that. But back then, even vitamin D, you know, I mentioned vitamin D to her and she was just like, no, no, no. But, you know, we have a lot of clear <laughs> evidence now linking vitamin D in the immune system. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it was kind of a different world back then too. So. It was, but like, okay, maybe there's no, um, you know, clinical trials, but it just, you're living proof, you know? Yeah. So that's really part, like, it's like the medical paradigm is so limited because the mindset of the people within it are so limited because the medical paradigm is so, it's just like this yeah. feedback loop that feeds into itself. And I, and that's why, of course, there's just such a gigantic explosion and in interest in alternative, quote, again, forms of healing. And I say that in quotes because, you know, these aren't alternatives at all. These are how humans have been healing themselves and each other for millennia. It's really modern mm -hmm. medicine that's the like anomaly mm -hmm. in the history yeah. of humanity. So it's, you know, awesome for like surgery and emergency care, but we are just as the tagline for this podcast is remembering what it is to be human upon the earth. And plants are such an important part of that. So Something I recently talked about um, with Sage Popham on this podcast is just how many ways there are to be an herbalist. You know, I think when people who are feeling called, but they're really new and they might only think there's one or two ways to do it, but there's as many ways to be an herbalist as there are herbalists out there. Mm -hmm. And an herbalist is mm -hmm. just someone who works with plants. So yeah. what do you see, what has been like the main focus of your work as an herbalist? What role do you see yourself <laughs> occupying in that space? Yeah. I, that's such a great question. Cause I often say like, I wonder what kind of herbalist I'm going to be when I grow up. <laughs> um, because I really don't know, like I have done so many different aspects of herbalism. You know, I sold um, my herbal wares at the farmer's market. I've, um, I was a herbal, I call a clinical herbalist, just as a means of describing, I worked one-on-one -on -one with people who had chronic health issues. I did that for many years. Um, so yeah. And, you know, I, I've written lots of articles, lots of eBooks, shared a lot that way. Um, I teach online courses. I've taught in-person courses. I've done longer intensives. So I've done it in so many different ways. And I, I do wonder, like, who, I have that question. I pose that question often. Um, but ultimately, I I love to teach and I love to share what I've learned. And I love to um, share not only my experience and my passion, but also I love taking what could be a complex topic or you know, something that has multiple layers. And I like distilling it down to make it really simple and easy to get. Like, I love to hear from my students, like that they got it and um, that they not only got it, but then they brought it into their lives. And so um, I teach, you know, by sharing my experience, by, you know, distilling that information in a way that I hope is helpful for people to really get, but also by really encouraging people to try herbs, whether that's just trying a simple herb, tasting it, touching it, feeling it um, in their bodies, or recipes. And I teach a lot via recipes because I truly do want to, you know, be able to sh share people, here's the gifts of this plant as I understand it, here's my experiences that I understand it. But really the ultimate goal is that people bring that into their own lives, bring it into their kitchen, start using the herbs. And so they can really experience it for themselves because, um, like you said, just not as their, which I listened to that podcast with Sage. It was a wonderful podcast. Um, that not only is there so many ways of being an herbalist, but, um, just, we all have our own ways of being and seeing the plants and interacting with the plants and understanding them. And, and we all have something unique and beautiful to bring to the world of herbalism. And so, I want people to be tasting them so they can say, oh, well, here's what, here's what I learned from Rosalie about violets. And now I'm going to use violets and here's, you know, I can take that understanding and bring it, you know, five steps further as I work with this plant myself. So yeah. I don't know if that basically <laughs> to answer your question, I've done a yeah. lot of different <laughs> things, but ultimately I see myself as a, as a teacher and maybe just like a facilitator of helping people to get plants into their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you absolutely are. And of course, your writing is a part of that teaching and your writing is beautiful. And yeah, I was, as you were talking, I was like, oh, if she doesn't mention the recipes. I'm going to bring it up <laughs> <laughs> because that's really helpful for so many people. And your recipes are so good and straightforward. And um, you really do, you really do make it accessible. You like simplify what 
is so easy for the human mind to make complicated and, you know, get caught up and trip over. And even through like the presentation in your books, they're just simple and beautiful. And it's Aww. like you immediately understand what to do, what's going on, the concepts, and then these recipes are right there to bring it home and give you that, like, that sensation of using the plant into your body. Um, so on that note, please tell us about your new book, Wild Remedies. What, um, you know, I mean, a little bit about what, what it's about, but like what inspired you to create a book based on this idea? And how did you connect with your co-author, Emily Hahn? Mm, yeah. Yeah, it was definitely like kind of multiple layers there. Um, I actually wasn't like I got the exact idea to write this book from um, a conversation I had with Tori Amos, actually, a musician, um, composer, piano, songwriter. Um, so I I'd, I'd written my first book. And as soon as the first book was published, people were like, when's your second book? And I was like, oh, you haven't even read the first book. <laughs> um, and I really had, I didn't know, like I, the deal for my first book, Alchemy of Herbs, just kind of landed in my lap. And I never really saw myself as being an author of a book. Um, but I, you know, decided, I knew it was an amazing opportunity, so I went for it. Um, but I never, you know, by the time that was coming out, just so much work. I mean, I put years of work into these books. And when that, after that one came out, I was like, I don't think I, I'm going to write another book. Um, like that was enough for me. And, um, but in the book I had acknowledged Tori Amos cause she's been a really big part of my life. And then, um, and if you guys don't know, Tori, Tori has very obsessive fans of which I'm obviously one of them. Mm-hmm. I have so some I friends. had the opportunity, um, <laughs> to go to Ireland and meet her wow. and give her a copy of my book, which just seemed like the entirely sane thing to do. <laughs> so I went and I met with her and, um, and she was just so present and so kind and so grounded. And I was obviously like, ah. <laughs> um, but then she asked me a question. She, so I gave her the book and, and she, we took a picture together and she actually, she grabbed the book. She's like, Oh, we should take a picture with your book. And that was really cool that we have that picture. Cause yeah. I didn't do that. And then she asked me, she said, what is the best way to take herbal medicine? And I know that she was asking, you know, do you take it as a tincture or a tea? You know, I, that's, I'm, I'm guessing that's kind of what she meant, but even in that moment, you know, I took it in a different direction and I told her something which I hope was coherent about really the best way is to bring plants into your life, um, whether that's spending time with them or using them as food. And and so I kind of said something mumbly bumbly about that, I'm sure. Um, and so then it was, you know, days later, just a couple of days later, actually, and I'm kind of mulling over that conversation in my head is just going round and round because that was a pretty amazing experience for me to be able to meet her. And I just had this really clear, you know, really felt like I was just like hit with that um, sense of just like, that's what you will write a book about is how to bring herbs into your life and how to connect with nature. And and then seconds after that, I was like, and I will write that book with Emily Hahn. And so um, I knew I've known Emily for many years and um, she we've been friends and we've been working together for almost a decade and we've had many conversations about foraging and wildcrafting and and kind of like our joy of it and our and then our worry and fears about it um, in terms of you know repercussions of mindless uh, foraging or wildcrafting and so we'd had a lot of those conversations and and yeah so I, I presented the idea to her and and luckily she was on board because I really would not have written this book without her and writing it with her was such a joy. Um, we, it was amazing to us how much we were on the same page. Like we finished each other's sentences. We came up with the same idea at the same time. Um, so it, that all ran really smoothly, but, um, and then, so we had so much similarity and we just really were of like one mind in terms of writing it. But then we also come from very different backgrounds and very different perspectives in a variety of different ways. So I think we were able to bring different strengths to the book. Like Emily is very detail oriented. She is just so amazing. Um, she did lots of editing for the book. She kind of, she orchestrated a lot of botanical illustrations, which took a lot of like very precise, um, 
explanations of what we mm-hmm. wanted um, those to be in working with the botanical illustrator uh, herself. So anyway, it was just an amazing collaboration and, and it was just really fun and it was just an honor to work with her and, and then to be able to create something like this because that I got the idea for the book in September of 2017. And so it took you know, almost three years before we see this into fruition. And we were, we've been working on it that whole time. So a lot wow. goes into it. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, because it's not just the recipes. You know, your, your part one, I absolutely loved. It's kind of like, I don't know, theory and like grounding in these ideas. Actually, I'm going to read the um, seven chapter names. The Power of Plant Medicine, Getting to Know Where You Live, Wild Crafting Principles, Wild Crafting Practice, Botany Basics, Plants in the Kitchen, and The Joy of Reconnection, Living Deeply with the the Seasons. So let's talk a little bit about that last, that last piece there. Um, I, so much of what keeps people feeling disconnected is that they just don't have a relationship with the place they're in, you know, living Mm -hmm. in a city or a high rise apartment, you're just not literally not grounded and maybe not even really feeling super like safe being outdoors or, or Mm -hmm. maybe there aren't those places nearby. Um, But how can, how can people learn to belong to the place they're in by rooting themselves in the seasons of the year? Mm -hmm. I think rooting ourselves in the seasons is one of, the easiest and also the biggest steps we can take for that rooting experience. And it is a weird thing that so in so many places in our culture, we're not taught, you know, that we're almost not only taught, not taught about the seasons, but almost like removed from where we are. Um, And so an example of that is when I was writing the book, I kept thinking about when I was in elementary school, again, in Southern Utah, where it's the desert and it does not snow. And the teachers, you know, every December, January, you know, you had those like kind of um, cartoonish calendar things put up on the bulletin board and they were always like snowmen, you know, like in snow and snowflakes and stuff. And it's just like, that's weird, you know, that we're just like taught, I think in so many places we're taught this like idea of this four season <laughs> you know, world and no matter where you live though, I mean, it's just, that is weird. (laughs) So, um, and then we also have this idea too, of like so many of us have moved and maybe, you know, we didn't grow up where we live now is not where we grew up or maybe it was, but in any case, um, being aware of the seasons and really immersing ourselves in them is so important. And again, another, I guess another thing I'd want to bring up is how easy that it is to ignore the seasons because we have things like um, air conditioning or heating uh, inside our buildings. And so we don't have to necessarily experience weather as it is, except for like getting into like, you know, from our car to the building. Um, And we have things like grocery stores that are stocked with fresh foods all year round. So you can, in December, you can go get a, a fresh tomato at the grocery store, you know, even though it might taste like cardboard and be mush, but we can still get them. Um, and that's, you know, again, kind of a a strange thing. Um, and so by, you know, being aware of the seasons, it's just is such a powerful thing because it, that sense of passing of time, being able to enjoy something in that sweet moment, you know, before it, before it keeps moving on forward, I think is what can bring some of our most intense joys. And I think of some things like, you know, there's this like, craze for pumpkin spice in the fall. Like, I mean, it's just like unreal. I mean, it makes the headlines um, of like when pumpkin spice becomes available. And I think that that's like a sign of so many people in our culture craving, you know, that seasonal aspect of something, you know, and loving it um, so deeply. Um, But you know, that's kind of like this funny thing because it, it's added to every, you know, every latte made from coast to coast, north and south that during that specialized time. But there's so many things we can do, you know, looking around, seeing what our local farmers or our own gardens are producing at different times of year, really, really eating seasonally. Um, and of course, that also means the plants and being able to watch them grow through their the, through the whole growing season to watch how they shift and change. Um, to see how they react to the weather, um, to the growing growing days, shortening days, all of that has been, 
don't know, for me, one of the most um, powerful ways to to feel rooted and like I am here. And especially, you know, when, when you first begin, when I first began to do that, it was just eye opening, you know, back in those early days when I didn't know any plants and I was getting to know them. And it was just like, it was just so fascinating. Everywhere I looked, there was new plants. But then that's just a forever cycle that's continually deepening. And even this year, I, you know, I chose a plant that I don't know very well. And I've been already following it, watching how it, the buds have changed from January um, and then through February and March and, um, and, you know, spending more time with it. And so there's always so much more to learn and see and appreciate. And, and the more that happens, the more when I go out into the forest, which is where I live, I just feel like I am at home. Um, because I see, I see things that have become so familiar to me and I see the plants that have become my friends and I know, you know, the squirrels <laughs> and, and where they're at on their corners. And, um, you know, I recognize, I just beginning to recognize and see myself as a part of it, you know, not, not as separate from it. Mm-hmm. What's the new plant that you're working with? Ceanothus. It's our um, local red root mm-hmm. and I've long loved it, but I only tend to notice it when it's in bloom, when it's in bloom, the mm-hmm. smell is just incredible. It's big white um, flowers and the pollinators love them. Um, and, but I just kind of notice it here and there. I always notice it when we walk by because the smell of it is just so incredible. I, it's like this vanilla resin, amber kind of smell. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah, I think one of my most favorite smells. So yeah, this year I thought, well, I'm just really want to get to notice it. Um, notice who visits, notice who eats it. Well, you know, one thing I noticed is that um, when it's really cold, the leaves curl up and protect themselves. And it was interesting mm-hmm. to be able to tell how severe the temperature, obviously I'm aware of what the temperature is, but to see that reflected in Ceanothus, like in my walks. So where I live, it's um, below freezing and lots of snow every winter. So, you know, be able to, but some days are warmer than others, you know, and, um, and so be able to see like, oh, look, the ceanothus has opened up a little bit and it is about, you know, 10 degrees warmer today. Or, oh, look how closed up and tight it is. And it is a really cold day today. Um, anyway, that's, oh, like, <laughs> my, that's so my neat. So yeah. fascinating to be able to like see them. and Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have actually a couple on our property and tons growing around us, different varieties too. Um, so now I'm going to notice. I've also never noticed the scent. I'm going to pay attention to that when they start blooming but I can see how um you know you hadn't paid much attention before because it's such a, just a nondescript shrub when it's mm-hmm. not in bloom and it's sometimes those like not so sexy plants that have so much medicine and healing and things to teach us once we pay attention mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that plant also came up in my first interview with Seja I think episode 17 mm. um yeah yeah, I something that I really love. Like I lived in San Diego for a year when I was 19 and 20. And it's like basically one season, you know, down there. It's just why people mm-hmm. always talk about why Southern California has the perfect weather. Um, and then living in Lake Tahoe, it's basically winter and summer. You know, you might get a mm-hmm. little spring or fall. But where I live now in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada in California, it's really like four seasons. And I love it so mm. much. And it really has, now that I'm thinking about it, like helped ground me as an herbalist. Um, <clears throat> so what um, what can like stewardship of the land, tending to the land, how can that enhance our connections within our communities and, and even healing within communities? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so something Emily and I talk a lot about in Wild Remedies is being stewards of the land and tending and that being that mindset being really the first step to foraging and wild crafting. And, um, you know, when I first started foraging, um, like the very first thing I foraged like intentionally was blackberries. My friends and I were at a park and um, in Seattle and there's in it's probably like August, September when the blackberries are just everywhere and there's so many of them and so we just found a big patch and we just picked them and threw them in a bag and we came home and, and we immediately made blackberry cobbler with them and through that whole experience it was such a fun experience you know being with friends and then of course eating lots of blackberries I remember just thinking like wow like this all this free food is just like sitting there all this free food I just kept thinking about that I thought that was so cool but um and so I you know it's a very easy um, 
way, you know, mental space to be in when we go out there and you start seeing the abundance of nature. But it's a problematic one um, if we only approach the plants as free medicine or free food. Um, and it's kind of a misnomer, too, because it's definitely not free. Obviously, it's not free to the plant, which, um, you know, is definitely paying for that. But also for us, I mean, it takes a lot of time and energy um, as well. So free, you know, there's no monetary exchange often in, in foraging, but it's definitely not free. And then that mentality uh, is, can be very harmful. So instead, we think, you know, the first step is to be able to visit a space and ask, how can I be of service here? And that's the first step. And that there's no, you know, one way to do that. It really is showing up consistently and showing up with curiosity and showing up with this heart-centered desire for reciprocity and asking, you know, how can I be of service? How can I help here? And that's something we also talk a lot about in the book because it's just so important. And um, and I know for some probably not to your listeners, Amber, but some, some people might think that's weird to have like reciprocity with a plant. Um, but really, you know, forming relationships with plants are, is not unlike forming relationships with people. And, and when we have relationships with people that are just one sided, where one person gives and one, you know, but and the other person just takes and there's no reciprocity, those are really brittle relationships that, you know, are, are, going to be toxic in one way or another and probably won't ultimately last. And so we don't want those kinds of relationships with the plants, right? We want these deep uh, reciprocal relationships. And the way we do that is by not just taking, by not showing up and saying, you know, what is here for me, but showing up and saying, how can I, how can I give back? And that, that can be such simple things like picking up trash. It could be things like clearing away plants that might be choking out other plants um, it could be, uh, pruning plants in such a way that they brings more health. So for example, elder trees, um, or shrubs are a plant that they tend to have a lot of dead growth on them. And so they really do well with plant and human interaction, uh, for us to go in and help prune away that dead old growth and bring um, help them, you know, to grow stronger and bring forth new, new growth. Um, so that's kind of, you know, there's, we, there can be ways that we can harvest from plants that can help grow them. It can be, you know, as simple as gathering seeds and spreading them. It can be, um, uprooting even roots, you know, sometimes root medicine is necessary. And by even the process of digging up roots can actually aerate the soil, uh, allow space for new seeds to grow um, but it, again, it all comes down to doing so with awareness and attention and being able to kind of use our critical thinking skills to say like, okay, you know, what is needed here and how can I support further growth of this plant? How can I help this plant to go strong, to grow more strong, um, and, and be an interactive participant in the area. And I believe so strongly in that because the more that we have a hands-off attitude towards nature, you know, this idea, I think, you know, I'll well, just back up, I guess. We have so many instances and circumstances where humans have played a really negative role in our green spaces. And I think it's really easy for us to jump to it and say humans should stay away from nature because obviously they ruin it. Um, but there's so many flawed uh, nuances of that. Like one just even this idea that we are separate from nature, I think is a theme that can be very harmful um, just within our entire culture. And then two, to buy into that we only have, a ne you know, humans only have negative effects out there. Uh, we need to be writing a different story. And, um, and I think that comes from participating and from showing the plants, showing our communities, showing ourselves how we can create uh, really positive changes and, positive growth, not only in the plants and their ecosystems, but within ourselves as well. Um, and that another simple way, and this is maybe my, I think one of my favorite ways, and because it's so simple and so attainable is that the more people who learn how amazing dandelion leaf pesto is and how beautiful and fun those flowers are to eat, the more we can enjoy that and then share that with our neighbors. And then the love of dandelions just being spread round, the less we could see Roundup being sprayed. Mm -hmm. I mean, billions of dollars are spent every year buying 
incredible amounts of this poison that is basically used on lawns, you know, by our neighbors and, you know, poisoning their, their lawns, poisoning ours, poisoning waterways, um, poisoning just a bit everyone, of, it's poisoning everyone. Exactly. And it's really just a symptom though, right? Of like, it's a buying roundup is a symptom of a lack of connection to the plants. It's a symptom of this strange desire for this weird lawn, a <laughs> perfect lawn, but it's just a symptom. And so I, you know, getting to the root of it, you know, learning to love dandelions, like if that one thing happened, if just we were able to like spread that love far and wide, that would be a huge, huge contribution to the world around us just by the lack of roundup that then would be spread. So ubiquitously yeah. in our neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> It makes me think about, I think a lot of people have this um, false idea that the peoples native to the Americas were just, you know, living so simply off the land, just taking whatever they could find, just foraging and hunting. But what we know now is that, and I, I know most about this in the California tribes because there's a beautiful book about it, Tending the Wild, that the Native Americans were intimately and actively involved in and changing the landscapes they lived in and managing the plants and the animals. Like they were basically farming. They were wild farming. And of course, like all the out of control wildfires here in California now are partially to due to the fact that we don't do controlled burns that they knew how to do. Um, so it kind of just speaking to that I, false idea that some people might have that like we should just completely leave nature alone. Like it's never been like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Never. Like, yeah. people's have People have always been – actively involved in managing the land too. And when they are doing it correctly, which I'm, you know, assuming all of our ancestors did basically, at least during the Paleolithic, then they were doing it in a way that benefited all the species, all the beings, all the living things around them, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's just something that a lot of us are trying to learn to recreate. And I think your book is definitely an important step toward that. <clears throat> um, so I have written here on my notes, the gifts of specific plants, guides to ethical foraging, and a look at their ecological connections. Um, so obviously that's not really a question, but what it's making me think about is, of course, there are certain like foundational guidelines for ethical wildcrafting, which you cover in your book, but also each plant is different and have their different needs and how they can best be approached and best practices for foraging. And of course, we don't need to trip ourselves up like memorizing a list of how to forage each plant out there. But um, yeah, I'm curious, like, okay, let's talk about violets. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about violets. Um, we just had the most incredible violet bloom I have ever seen, ever. Oh. And, and it was my whole county, like people all over were like posting about it. My friends were texting me like, oh my God, look at my violet patch. And it was really the first time I ever remember, like as soon as we stepped outside, we could just smell them. It was just oh, wow. hitting us from the side yard. And I've never seen them that big. It was just incredible. Um, so I'm right now riding high on a violet wave and was so <laughs> happy to see you include this this plant in your book. Of course you did. Um, so yeah, just anything, anything you want to share about your relationship with violets, wildcrafting them, working with them. And of course you've got all these amazing recipes in the book too. Yeah. So I'm actually, that is probably one of my favorite herbs in the book, although they're all my favorites, but <laughs> <laughs> definitely violet. And I think, you know, part of it is because I'm kind of newer to violets myself. I live in a very um, dry, arid climate that don't are not really known for um, you know violets. Like there's so many violets, like the dog violets and violet odorata, that are will grow kind of in like weeds everywhere. We have a lot of native violets, but we didn't have that kind of ubiquitous kind. And so it's something I've used in the past 20 years. But it was last year that um, I found out a farm near me had. They had like planted violets in their farm, a, you know, a couple decades ago. And now the violets there are just amazing. They are just, you know, covered the, this huge area. And so they invited me there and 
to harvest and I just harvested basketfuls and made so many things out of them. And, oh, just like the whole experience, you know, they, they say violet gladdens the heart and absolutely that is true. Mm -hmm. And just spending time harvesting them was like the whole, that whole experience was so incredibly joyful. This, you know, the bird song and the, the feel of the sun on my face and being out there in this early spring days, gathering these beautiful, beautiful flowers. And they make such beautiful medicine. Oh my gosh, <laughs> those flowers, you know, the purple flowers, you can make them into syrups. You can add a little bit of acid and change the colors of them so they can be anywhere from pink to purple. And then you can make so many delicious drinks out of them. You can make mocktails or alcohol cocktails. Um, just the syrup itself is so soothing and wonderful using that as a gentle lymphatic uh, when they're swollen lymph or to soothe a sore throat. Um, and so those are kind of two main ways I use it. But violet is also really amazing for coughs and especially dry spasmodic coughs. Violet is just it goes in there gently but surely and just helps relieve that tension and dryness that might be causing the cough um, and to bring relief and those dry spasmodic coughs can be so painful and to have this beautiful medicine that you harvested yourself um, and you know brought joy during the harvest and then can bring such relief for those that type of cough is just so important um, in clinical practice I recommended violets a lot um, as a really strong tea and and used in that way it modulates inflammation uh, really well. And so I'd often use it for people who had signs, especially of skin inflammation, um, like uh, rashes that might have been diagnosed as eczema. That can just be a, a really powerful way to just quell inflammation. And they also have a lot of nutrients too that um, have been shown to um, really strengthen the heart and blood vessels. So it's one of those I just love them because they're this, they can grow like a weed. They can be so ubiquitous. They're so beautiful. They're so fun to harvest. And then just bringing them into your life has so many benefits that, um, you know, there's not just one thing to do with them. There's so many things and, mm -hmm. and you can use them intentionally as medicine, uh, or again, just bring them into your life as, um, you know, a, a way to experience the seasons because, um, you know, medicine made from the violets that you had this year, um, you know, that'll probably, you know, I love that kind of stuff when there's a big bloom like that, because it could be like just the memory, you know, like, oh, the, the <laughs> spring 2020 violet <laughs> blooming, you know, and it'll be talked about for years <laughs> to come. And, and for a while you can have medicine from those, you know, but eventually that medicine will run out, you know, the, the herbs that we make into medicine don't last forever. Um, so it's kind of like, think of it as like a fine wine, you know, when they talk about like, oh yeah, the Cabernet from 1971 was yeah. amazing. <laughs> that becomes our medicine too, you know, like, oh yeah, the, the syrup <laughs> that I made from that 2020 harvest is just so incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And something I like to do too, when I've made my medicine and bottled it and I put this label on it and I'm writing like violets in apple cider vinegar, you know, in the date, and then I'll write like, one of the first warm days of spring, um, mm. you know, like Nixie learned how to write her name or just, you know, whatever else was going on around me that at the time, like, is, and because then when I'm taking it, I always remember, oh, that was the day or the week or the month that that happened and just mm -hmm. kind of bringing that story medicine into it. So yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. Whenever I take the medicine we made this year, I'm going to remember like that was the violet super bloom of 2020. <laughs> Yeah, I love that you're bringing in those other stories, too, because that's really, you know, when Tori asked me that question, you know, like, how is it best to take herbs? There's such a qualitative difference between, like, doling out some herbal capsules into your hand and swallowing them down. And then there's, you know, between the difference of, like, pulling out this lovingly made syrup that has these beautiful memories wrapped up into it and um, to have that for yourself and then to share that with your loved ones you know, this, this was the day, you know, that this happened. And, um, there is just a major qualitative difference. And I just never think that like those, those capsules are going to have that same sense. And, you know, I use herbal capsules. I'm not like entirely opposed to them, but the more we can incorporate our experiences into our medicines, into our foods and just into the world around us, the more meaningful and joyful life is. Yeah. Yeah, and that one is such a delight to the senses, you know, just mm -hmm. obviously the scent, but also the taste of the flowers. I've seen my 
three-year-old Nixie, she'll just eat like 20 <laughs> in a row. And then and then the leaves, they're so different from the flowers. And mm-hmm. I love how when you chew them, they're so um, mucilaginous. Like you can feel, mm-hmm. you know, that moistening property to it. And when you put them in, um, when you make a tea out of them, like I had um, violet leaf tea in my, in my water bottle last week. And my oldest, Mm. who's 13, my Celia, my Celia Violet actually is her middle name. Mm. Mm. Um, she thought it was water and she drank it and she's like, wow, that just tastes like just green. That's like the essence of green. And I was like, oh my God, Mm. that's what I always think when I drink (laughs) violet leaf tea. It's just like the taste of green right there. (laughs) Mm. Um, so, you know, obviously that's a special plant for me to share with my kids and it's a plant kids. It's a plant everyone loves, you know, kind of like you. It's just no one, no one is not stoked on violets as long as they've <laughs> been introduced and got to spend the time. So if I remember correctly, you did not cover violets in Alchemy of Herbs. No. And no. I remember being like, oh, I want to know what <laughs> Rosalie has to say about violets. So I was really happy that you got them in this book. <laughs> Um, let's just look at one other plant and I'm going to ask you about another one that's just, you know, exploding all over around us right now and that my kids love and I love and that's chickweed. Mm, Yeah. So how do you, how do you like to interact with chickweed? Oh, chickweed. Well, it's such a fun one to find growing and, um, and just experience, you know, and I, it's so like violets, how you can just eat the, eat the flowers, violets as you're picking same with chickweed you know you can just be snipping off little bits and eating them right out of the garden and I love or right out of the soil that they're coming from but I love that because it's like doesn't get fresher than this Mm -hmm. (laughs) straight straight right well also Um, there's all this um evidence now that like literally within five minutes of picking I think tomato is what I saw studied it loses a good amount of its nutrients like mm -hmm. literally within minutes Mm -hmm. so yeah if you can eat a plant like seconds after it comes out of the soil I've even heard Dr. Zach Bush who's a genius and one of my favorite people to follow say that he'll like eat the tomato on the vine (laughs) just to get like the ultimate nutrients so yeah that's such a good idea to be nibbling as you're foraging Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that that makes I'll go I'll go back to chickweed, but it makes me think of um, how important it is to have wild foods and just different foods in our life from mm-hmm. um, this perspective of like getting a variety of phytonutrients into yeah. our lives. Yeah, because it's in the world we live in, it's so easy to eat the same five vegetables or fruits day in and day out. Mm -hmm. Um, And in fact, many people in the United States do, you know, they like ketchup and iceberg lettuce (laughs) and just these few things, but they just have these limited phytonutrients within them. And wild foods are so nutrient dense, you know, they haven't had their phytonutrients, um, you know, bred out of them. And they're growing in wild soils that have, they're rich in nutrients. And so it's a great way to just get this burst of nutrition and goodness uh, into our lives just by yeah. kind of expanding what we eat. Yeah, that's and so easy. Is so wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> so easy. Yeah. And chickweed is such a wonderful way to do that. When chickweed is in season here, we eat so much of it. I love it as a salad. I love it um, like as a garnish for practically like when they're in season, we have it like chopped up and pretty much like on everything, kind of like micro greens or something, but just, mm. you know, chopped up and on everything. Um, probably my most favorite way is as a, a pesto. And, um, and I've been making that for so many years, actually one of my first dates with my now husband, um, I had this great, you know, the chickweed was in bloom and so are available. So I was like, Oh, let's go gather chickweed and and we'll make pesto out of it. And then I went to the store and I got pine nuts to make the pesto with, and they were still shelled. Mm. And so we spent like hours (laughs) shelling pine nuts together. And the whole time, I think he was just kind of like, whoa. (laughs) That was like one of our first dates, (laughs) shelling pine nuts. So we could make this pesto, but the pesto is just so bright tasting. Um, It's so delicious. And we will make up now quarts and quarts and quarts of it and freeze it and in the winter time we'll pull out all these quarts of pesto you know we'll use it as a base on our homemade pizza or um use it with pasta or just use it um to dip you know dip our carrots into it whatever 
however you want to eat it. It is so delicious and it's such a fun way to take the abundance of the spring grains and then enjoy them throughout the winter. So we're getting those fresh, you know, the kind of semi-fresh, I guess, um, tastes that aren't always available in the winter. So Mm. that's another lovely way because it does have so many nutrients. I love making vinegar out of it. You mentioned violet vinegar, which also is just heavenly. Um, and chickweed vinegar, so easy, you know, you harvest the fresh chickweed, chop it up, put it in a jar, fill, fill up the jar with apple cider vinegar, um, put a glass or plastic lid on it. You don't want metal lid and shake that up, let it sit for a little while. And and then that, you know, vinegar just excels at getting the nutrients, especially minerals out of plants. And so it's pulling all those minerals out. And then, then we use that as a basis for our salad dressings, uh, that spring and summer. So that's another another favorite way. So um, smart to freeze it for when it's gone. Yeah. Oh, when I bring that, you know, over to friend's house, I mean, it's just like everyone's like, ooh. Mm-hmm. I live in a very rural place and a lot of us just eat the um, vegetables that only come from here. And so in the wintertime, you know, there's lots of carrots, lots of potatoes, cabbage, beets, you know, lots, all of our storage root crops are available. But, you know, the, those that fresh green chickweed, obviously not available. And it becomes so precious and so special and so fun to enjoy that. Yeah. Another interesting thing I was thinking of with the phytonutrients is even if you are eating a lot of vegetables, um, like all the cruciferous vegetables are basically giving you the same nutrients as one another. You know, like you might have broccoli and um, Brussels sprouts and bok choy on your plate and be like, look at me with my three vegetables. But they're in the same family, the brassicas, and they're all like really similar to each other nutrient wise. And so Mm -hmm. it's, it's just hard for us modern humans if we're getting all of our food from the grocery store to really be diversifying our nutrient intake. And it's so easy when you're outside, especially like (laughs) at this time of year to just, you know, grab what's there and really get some very different and much needed nutrients into your body. Um, So thank you for bringing that up. That's something I think about when I'm outside here on the land. I'll be like, when is the last time I ate something, you know, that wasn't just the same old stuff that came from the grocery store? Oh my gosh. And I'll just get down and find all the chickweed and the miner's lotus and the violets and the whatever else is coming up, dandelions, which are just starting Mm -hmm. to. Um, So I'm just looking at your chickweed chapter and I thought I would just kind of um, give folks a very brief overview of like how each of these plants are presented in the book because you really give so much good information that goes beyond what you normally find in books that go plant by plant, you know? So you have medicinal properties and energetics, plant gifts, and this is where you're talking about, um, you know, the healing properties. Like here for chickweed, you have nutrient, provides nutrient-dense food, quells coughs, soothes the eyes, heals skin conditions and infections, and moves the lymph. And then how to identify. And of course, there's gorgeous pictures throughout. Mm -hmm. Um, Ecological connections. So kind of what we were talking about just a few minutes ago in that non-question question. question. Um, And I love that. I can't wait to read the ecological connections for each and every plant in here. How to harvest. And then these beautiful botanical illustrations that you talked about. I can't wait actually to spend more time with this one mm. on chickweed. It's such these flowers are that so was our interesting. First illustration oh. that we did with the chickweed. That it's was just so like, beautiful. It was so exciting. I when we first started talking about them doing botanical illustrations, somehow I just thought we were going to do like line drawings or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but as it evolved, that we're doing these like that we were going to work with um, Ghana actually, is, um, botanical illustrator who lives in the Ukraine, and have these beautiful watercolor you know, illustrations. Oh, it was just so exciting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you even have like the wasp or a, a moth on it that pollinates it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was really fun to decide to do that. So yeah. um, Emily is a naturalist and she loves bugs. Um, and she actually has really inspired the love of bugs in me. And that ecological connection section was um, has really inspired me. You know, Emily really brought that in and that's been one of my favorite parts of the book. And, and so we had all the botanical illustrations and it was actually one of the last things we decided. We were like, oh, we have, you know, if this is a book about showing ecological connections and, and trying to root ourselves and, in, in it all and, and not just be about plants and humans, then we need to 
uh, show these beautiful creatures that coexist. And so, yeah, we, and that was fun choosing them because all of the um, bugs or reptiles or whatever creature that we have with the plant were specifically chosen because they have a, a connection. So like in the violet illustration, which is one of maybe one of my favorites of the whole book, um, we have the fritillaria butterfly, which the fritillarias often only lay their larva um, on violets, kind of similar wow. to like monarchs and milkweed. Uh-huh. And then that beautiful moth on the chickweed. Yeah. Yeah. Those are really, those are very exciting part of the oh book. Oh my gosh. I love it. Talk about going beyond what's in your usual herb book. Uh, and then you have harvesting cautions, gardening tips, using chickweed in your life, um, and then the recipes. Yeah, chickweed yeah. vinegar and your pesto recipe is in here. Of course, it looks amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and- yeah, you know, we wanted – that reminds me. We, want, we wanted to do gardening tips in there. And we actually um, went to an expert for that, Sue Kush, um, and she helped us write those gardening tips section for each one because the book is ultimately about nature connection – that's for us. You know what the book is about strengthening your connection to nature. And that does not have to include foraging. Um, you know, that might not be of interest to someone maybe, you know, because of where they live or because of physical capabilities or just their interest, but nature connection is always possible. And so we give, you know, ways in the book, uh, that people can, um, bring plants into their life, whether or not they decide to forage, uh, they can garden, and that could be not only in their garden, but in a friend's garden or at a community garden. Um, but it can also be about getting fresh local plants from your local herb farmer. Or so many uh, vegetable farmers now are bringing their weeds to the market, which I love to see, you know, these big dandelion leaves and mm-hmm. chickweed even and nettle. Um, so there's so many ways to bring the joy of these plants into your life. And we definitely, you know, advocate for participating and and the joy that foraging can bring but it doesn't it doesn't have to be nature connection isn't beholden to your ability or desire to do that so yeah I'm glad yeah. you brought that up thank you um oh I was just gonna say briefly your the next cha- uh, the next recipe is chickweed salve and that is something that I've been making usually with plantain for 13 years since my oldest was a baby and it is mm-hmm. just our go-to you know I mean there's so many good salves out there I always say it's mm-hmm. hard to make a bad salve you know if you're like just if you know your ingredients you know how to make the salve well um there's so many helpful salves that we have in our house but we just go to this chickweed all the time because like any time they had a diaper rash cuts and scrapes it's so immediately effective for those kind of skin conditions so mm-hmm recommend people make this chickweed salve. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I, I'll make it and, um, I made it several years ago for a newsletter, you know, it's like a, I was make, doing an article. So I made it and so I could take all the photos and stuff and, and, and you know, I had extra, you know, like I made eight tins or whatever and I'm, I don't, you know, I just need one tin for me. And so I put it out there to people who lived around here, like who wants some chickweed salve? And Oh man, those just disappeared. Everyone, you know, and then I just for months later would hear those stories, you know, about especially diaper rash and, you know, all sorts of like dry, you know, irritation skin things just clears them right up. And I just, I love that so much, you know, that's something that I just harvested fresh from the earth, used all these local ingredients and made it into medicine. And how much cooler that is than going to the drugstore and, you know, buying this thing that was made far away in a factory in ways that we don't really understand or support and then you know was shipped from there to here and yeah. uh, you know it's just like the <laughs> the ability to use really effective and safe medicines that grow outside our door has so many benefits for our heart you know our own joy as well as just the world we want to live in and being a more sustainable um society yeah and for me it was when I was first studying herbalism and my teacher Cami McBride who's been on the podcast three times and I know as a friend of yours um, yeah you know, she had just yeah. taught me how to make salve and I came home and I was like oh I've got all this chickweed and plantain and so it was one of those early experiences of oh herbs work mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah and that's always a nice experience to have and to give to other people mm-hmm. um, so I was so intrigued when I saw that you have an afterword entitled what if everyone wildcrafted and I was really curious what you guys had to say about this because it's something I've definitely thought about before you know and 
like, should I even talk about wild crafting, like on Instagram or in my podcast? Um, but I absolutely love what you have to say about this. So can you, um, can you answer that question for us? What if everyone wild crafted? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I love that too, because it, obviously that's a question that can have a lot of fear around it and rightfully so, because we have examples of people who have gone and wild crafted plants and decimated their populations or destroyed that local habitat. So, um, there's, there is a fear there, but we ask that question, you know, we, with hope because we're asking it from a point of view of that mindset that I was talking about earlier with reciprocity and showing up to these spaces as stewards. And if, if more and more of us show up to tend these spaces to be stewards, the more we become invested into that relationship, uh, the more beautiful of a world we'll live in. And um, in some ways, you know, probably the people who are listening to this podcast might be preaching to the choir somewhat, you know, because we do love the the world around us and, and we're wanting the best for it and wanting to connect there. And just imagining like that spreading because that is actually not the world we live in right now. Um, you know, that people, if the majority of people in the U.S. aren't showing up to green spaces and saying, how can I be of service here? Um, but what if they did? You know, that would be a really amazing transformation um, if people were connected to nature because we wouldn't be pouring, you know, billions of dollars worth of poisons into our lawns and waterways every year the way we are now. You know, how I think we would be living our lives very differently and joyfully. You know, that's one thing um, in the face of all of the climate crisis that we're facing today and how incredibly scary that can be uh, and fearful. Uh, I think that our strengthening our connection to nature doesn't have to be fear-based. It can be love-based and, and the joy that we get there. And so if we're spreading that joy, spreading that empowerment that we've been talking about of harvesting these local weeds, making effective medicine out of them, yeah, we would be so much stronger and healthier in our communities um, and not just our human communities, but when we spray those poisons, we're affecting so many beings out there, our pollinators, um, our microbes in the soil, uh, the birds, you know, and on and on and on, you know, there's nothing that's not being affected by that. And so if we are coming from this place of stewardship, coming from a place of service, we're going to be making much stronger communities and it'll just be a natural step that we're taking better care of this world because um, so many, I think my personal belief is that so much of the environmental destruction that we see right now, it's it's a symptom. And we need to fight absolutely to protect those spaces when they're under threat. That's absolutely important. And also think of the root cause of that destruction. Um, and the root cause I, for me keeps coming back to this nature connection situation that um, when we see ourselves apart from nature, when we see the green world around us as a resource that can be taken, um, then that's, you know, that is the root of the problem. And the best way to fix that symptom and that or that root problem um, in order to fix the symptom is by increasing that nature connection in ourselves and then spreading that joyfully to all of those people around us. And, and people want it. You know, I can't tell you how many times you know, I've been um, my face has been flushed with the joy of wild crafting or I'm sharing, you know, something that I made that, you know, from something I harvested and, and people see that they connect that and they, you know, they want that, um, in their lives as well. And it, it becomes a joy to spread. So if, if everyone wild crafted, if we were all stewards, if we were all visiting these places, protecting them, taking care of them, nurturing them and spreading that love, I think we're going to be living in a much different world and a world that's you know, more, more based in love, more based in sustainability and a lot more resilient. Yes. It's so beautiful. Thank you. I love how you just reframed that question for me and, um, your answer was beautiful, but I highly recommend people read that in your book too. It's just like a page, but it's so, so well-written and it just, it really moved me when I read it. Mm. Um, so thank you. And I want to also just quickly add that you know, you talked about how this nature disconnection is is causing the climate crisis and ecological crises on the planet. But you also, in your introduction, really tie in this disconnection from nature and na nature deficit disorder um, to our lack of health in, in individuals as humans. And that, you know, you even in this intro 
Um, I'm just going to read this first paragraph. Do you ever feel overwhelmed by the idea of healthy living? Specialty drinks, herbal powders, high powdered blenders, superfruit smoothies, CrossFit, earthing, biohacking, microdosing, bulletproof coffee, <laughs> spoonful of coconut oil, or was that apple cider vinegar, green tea, vegan diet, paleo diet, keto diet? breatharianism, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's something I've talked about on this show quite a bit is, um, is food confusion, you know, and diet confusion. I certainly have been there and I'm, am still there in some ways. And just reading that intro, I was like, oh my gosh, like they're right. <laughs> you know, if I was just like outside in nature, first of all, we know that has so many health benefits, just being in nature, just being on the earth, but and was getting more of my food and my medicine that way, then I wouldn't have to be reading books on like, yeah, biohacking, keto, you know, <laughs> to try to like figure out what's wrong with me and how to feel better in my life. Um, so I really loved that too. Yeah, that was definitely a fun, a fun thing to write. And just, <laughs> yeah, just one of those things. I mean, looking out, it's just there is so much confusion. And I just don't think that we can solely um, buy ourselves into wellness. You know, it's, yeah. again, that's kind of that symptom root cause situation. And for me, health, and there's, I'm not like opposed to any kind of help that people get. Um, so it, when I mention all those things, it's kind of, you know, tongue in cheek, but I'm, but you know, those, those different things bring benefits to people. So that's great. But if we miss nature connection, then we're missing a huge part of joy and holistic healing yeah. because we simply cannot exist without it. And it's missing from so many of our lives that we just need to be consciously bringing ourselves back to that. Yeah. Yeah. We are not separate from nature. We are nature. We evolved being in direct communion and presence with the natural world. And of course, that's going to have extremely healing effects on all of us who were born into this very interesting <laughs> time in human history where that has really been taken from us by the culture. Um, so thank you for those reminders and, um, and your, so your new book, Wild Remedies is released today. I love that, um, I always release these podcasts almost always on a Tuesday and that your book comes out on a Tuesday. So I'm going to align those release dates. And if people want to check out the book through the link that I'll have in the show notes, and if they feel called to buy it, which of course I highly recommend, you're giving away um, as part of Learning Herbs like this incredible packet of bonuses. Um, mm -hmm. So what what are these bonuses? What can people get if they buy the book through that link? Um, I'm, I'm assuming there's some sort of time limit perhaps. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, so buying it this week is definitely really important. And um, that we have this wonderful docu series that Emily and I we flew to Boston and we interviewed twelve herbalists and we asked them questions like what you know can we wildcraft forever and what are unexpected ways that wild remedies heal and so it's it's really fun to see all these different herbalists um, it, it give their take on that and answer the question um, in that way and so those are really were beautifully produced and edited too so there's those are available and a lot of little other goodies that'll just help people, um, you know, get the most out of the book. So they're meant to be companions, uh, for the book. And, um, so yeah, we wanted to, you know, there's only, you know, the books are great and they can also be limiting just in that they're like this paper physical product. So we wanted to be able to add things like video and, um, other ways that people can experience the concepts in the book. Yeah. I'm always talking about how, if I really want to really take a subject in deeply. I, I want to read about it. I want to see videos. I want to hear podcasts, you know, mm -hmm. like all the different ways I can get it in really help. And I have written here too that um, part of it, you have like herb and recipe labels and there'll be a gift basket, drawing, giveaway, and then mm -hmm. some more things too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, people can read all about how that's going to go at, at that link and tell people where they can find you. Um, the best place to find me as is at herbswithrosalie.com and um, I send out a weekly newsletter and that's the best way to stay in touch with me. And when people sign up on the newsletter, I have a, a course, an herbal jumpstart course on how to choose the best herb for you. And, um, and then I send out weekly newsletters with all my updates and herbal monographs, recipes, and other fun things. 
Awesome. Um, okay, Rosalie, I'm so happy, like I said, that we finally connected and um, loving the book. Perfect time of year to release it, too. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm glad it worked out that way. <laughs> the sap is rising through the trees and the blood is moving through our bodies. Um, and we want to be outdoors connecting. So um, just very, very grateful for your work and so glad we got to talk today. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me, Amber. Okay, real quick, a very simple and superior way to freeze pesto is to make your pesto and then get out a baking tray like you'd put cookies on. And I have one of those Silpat silicone things that you can lay down on it. But really, I think it would be fine with nothing because it's pesto and it's super oily and... um you're not baking it anyway, so I don't know what it matters that it's nonstick. Um, but the oil will help it be nonstick for once you bring it out of the freezer anyway. So get out my baking tray, put my silpat on top of it, or not if you don't have one, though they are very convenient for baking all sorts of things. And then you spread out the pesto in about a quarter inch thick layer around the tray. And then you press wax paper on top of it and then you stick it in the freezer. And like our freezer is small and full of elderberries and bone broth and ginger juice and other things. And so, I mean, literally there's like an inch of room on top sometimes and this will fit in there still, which is great. So then it only takes a few minutes. I mean, a few hours to freeze. It's very quick. Um, and then you pull it out and I use the sharp end of a spatula to break it up into various size chunks. Um, and then those go into a Ziploc and store it in the freezer that way. And the point of doing it in various sizes is that you can pull out exactly the amount you need in the future when you're cooking. And this is what makes it superior to the, um, ice cube tray method that so many folks are enamored of with that one. First of all, it can be hard to pop those suckers out if you've ever tried that before. And then secondly, um, they're all the same size. So I really like this because you can just see exactly what size you're going to need for what you're making. And then also like I very quickly learned what size I like them to be in so they can fit in my jar later when I take them out to defrost. Like I take four or five of my little rectangles out, put them in the size jar that I like. And, you know, they defrost very quickly on the counter. Sometimes I put them in front of the heater vent or near the stove if we've got stuff cooking to help defrost more quickly. But certainly if you take it out at nighttime before bed, it'll be defrosted by the morning because again, that olive oil um, just makes it defrost more quickly. Comes in handy in many ways when it comes to pesto making and freezing and defrosting. And then it's there. I love it on breakfast. Love it with eggs. Basically put it on everything. Um, it's just so, so yummy. And if you need a visual for this, I um, have some slides up in my Instagram highlights. So I'm Mythic Medicine on Instagram. If you're not on there, you can find it on the internet at instagram.com slash mythicmedicine. And I have a highlight called Herbal Food, and that shows exactly how I froze my pesto. Um, I'll put that exact link in the show notes as well. So happy pesto making and freezing and defrosting and eating and happy spring. Thank you for taking these medicine stories in. I hope they inspire you to keep walking the mythic path of your own unfolding self. I love sharing information and will always put any relevant links in the show notes. You can find past episodes, my blog, and our handmade herbal medicines at mythicmedicine.love. We've got reishi, lion's mane, elderberry, mugwort, yarrow, redwood, body oils, an amazing sleep medicine, heart medicine, earth essences, so much more, more than I can list there, mythicmedicine.love. While you're there, check out my quiz, which healing herb is your spirit medicine? 
It's fun and lighthearted, but the results are really in-depth and designed to bring you into closer alignment with both the medicine that you're in need of and the medicine that you already carry and can bring to others. If you love the show, please consider supporting it at patreon.com slash medicine stories. It is so worth your while. There are dozens and dozens of killer rewards there, and I've been told by many folks that it's the best Patreon out there. We've got ebooks, downloadable PDFs, bonus interviews, guided meditations, giveaways, resource guides, links to online learning, and behind the scenes stuff, and just so much more. The best of it is available at the $2 a month level. Thank you. And please subscribe on whichever app you use. Just click that little subscribe button and review on iTunes. It's so helpful. And if you do that, you just may be featured in a listener spotlight in the future. The music that opens the show is by Marie Sue. That's M A R I E E. S-I-O-U-X from her beautiful song, Wild Eyes. Thank you, Marie. And thanks to you all. I look forward to next time.